Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Fall 2022, uh, BC206, talking this week, this semester. <clears throat> We're studying together on the ministry of the evangelist, teacher, and pastor. So it's good to see all of you uh, back. And uh, uh, yeah, let's get started with the session. Uh, let's begin probably with a word of prayer. So maybe one of us could please lead in prayer. Anybody? Oh. Father, we want to thank you for this morning. Lord, we come before your presence as your people. As we begin to learn a new subject today, Lord, we pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding and help us to know it, oh God, help us to understand uh, your thoughts. And we pray, oh God, that you would use us all to give your word uh, and help us to understand it clearly and help us to apply this in our own lives, God. We thank you for all of us. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, John. All right. So before we start today's session, uh, just give you a little bit uh, of uh, how the graded assessments are going to be. Uh, we'll have two assessments. Uh, so the first assessment will be on uh, the first or the second week of September. And that will be for 50 marks. And then the last week of November, which will be your final assessment, will again be for 50 marks. So we put that together. And that will be your final grading system. Right? That will be your final grading marks. Right? So that uh, I hope that's all right. 50 marks, second week of uh, September. And the final assessment, November last week. Uh, and so uh, this course that we're going to study together is a really interesting course and uh, just an introduction to what we're going to study uh, now many of us may feel hey i'm not uh, you know an evangelist or i'm I, i'm not a pastor or i'm not a teacher i just want to you know do ministry and uh, you know probably work in uh, and, and you know do ministry but here's the thing uh, when the lord jesus uh, talks about in the book when, when Apostle Paul talks in Ephesians chapter 4, he talks about the fivefold ministry. Uh, he does not say that this is only for people in the church. He doesn't say this is only for ministers who are in the church. He's just bringing forth the fivefold ministry. Right? And let's look at the introduction. Firstly, let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 77 to 16. Ephesians 4, 7 to 16. Now, uh, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And we must understand that in Ephesus, there are, you know, a lot of, uh, how would you say, uh, there were a lot of divisions happening. It was a very challenging place to minister. And uh, because we know the background of Ephesus, uh, there was a lot of idol worship, prostitution, uh, pagan gods that were uh, you know, prevalent during that time. And when this church was planted, uh, Paul, the apostle, stayed there for, uh, after, uh, after a few years, he stayed there for three years ministering to the people. Uh, and, and so he writes this fivefold ministry in Ephesians 4, 7 to 16. He's, he's writing to the church to tell them that this is what we are called for as a church. This is what the body of Christ is, right? And this is what it is made up of, right? And so let's read Ephesians chapter 4, 7 to 16. Yes, any one of us can read. Yes, anybody can read? I'll read uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 to 16. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ upon apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended meant except that he also descended to the lower 
lower regions. He who ascended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was the one, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in the disciples' scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will all th things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jiflin. All right. So I, I want to focus on a couple of words that the Apostle Paul uses here. Firstly, he says, the Lord made or the Lord put some to be apostles right so it is the lord's doing so the apostle paul is trying to tell the believers that it is not our own choosing right it's not something that i choose like for example i can't say hey uh, you know we looked at it even last uh, semester when we talked about you know uh, in lifestyle evangelism how uh, you know we, we we don't choose what god has called us to do God has called us. He's put, he has made us, right? So if I, if God has called me as a pastor, right, example, and I say, no, I want to be uh, an evangelist. I want to go out to different places. I want to explore different places. And this is what I want to do. Now, that is my own choosing. Right? It's, it's not something that God has assigned for me, right? But, but is it something that will be fruitful? Will we do the ministry in full measure that God expects us to do? And that's a question we must ask ourselves, right? Now, here it's interesting. It says the Lord put or the Lord has made some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So it's not our own doing, right? Of course, God has given us gifts, talents, right? And, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we did learn that in who we are in Christ, our gifts and our callings are always go together, right? But we must understand, this should be settled in our heart, that each one of us, whether we are pastor, whether we are evangelist, whether we are a prophet, whatever we are, it is the Lord who has put you there. You know, initially, uh, when I joined into the pastoral ministry, I thought to myself, hey, uh, Will I be able to do this? And uh, do you think it, uh, you know I'm capable of this? And you know, there are so many people who are much better, or you know there are so many people who are much more knowledgeable than me. Uh, and I remember you know, I, I battled with that thought for a long time. Uh, but I remember uh, you know just spending time in God's presence in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter one. How the Lord calls Jeremiah, right? And God tells Jeremiah, "I have chosen you." Don't tell me you are young. Don't tell me that you can't do it or you're, you've got other things to do. Or you know, Don't give these excuses because I have chosen you. you know, maybe some of us are feeling, you know, God, I don't know if this, this is something that I should do or I should start my own ministry. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm not capable enough. Remember this, right? Settle it in your heart. The Lord has put it. The Lord's work right? if you are a pastor if you are a evangelist if you are a teacher it is the lord's work now what is our responsibility our responsibility is to grow in that area right? that's our responsibility so god says okay i want you to be for example i want you to be a pastor right i'm just giving this example right now you know that god has called you so I, I can't sit around and say, okay, God, uh, you know, I will be a pastor someday. No, I'll have to prepare for it. Right? I know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, preparation work, a lot of studies, a lot of reading, a lot of, uh, you know, spending time in God's presence. I was reading this book 
uh, by Andrew Womack, and he mentions this sentence, which is which really touched my heart. He says, "True ministry is birth out of intimacy with God." And isn't that powerful? Right? True ministry, not just ministry. True ministry is birth out of intimacy with God. So when we know that God has called us. It is our responsibility to go back to God and ask God for strength, for wisdom, for grace, to carry on in the function that He has called us for. Right? So you know the enemy may come and put many thoughts in our hearts and our minds. You know what you have failed as a leader. You have you know you have not done what you are supposed to do. Uh, I don't see success in your ministry. There are no people coming in your church for the past two years. You're only you know twenty people. That's all the enemy's thoughts. But remember, it is the Lord who has placed you there. The Lord has appointed you. The Lord's calling upon you is what uh, you know is what is going on in your life. The ministry gift is a divine call. It's a divine call. It's it's not something that you know uh, a, a senior pastor or a, another prophet has spoken about. No, it's a divine call. Because God can use uh, prophets and other ministers of God to speak into our lives, but the divine call, the ministry gift, is a divine call, and God will place it in our heart, and we know that it is God, right? Uh, and this ministry gift, for example, a pastor, evangelist, a prophet, apostle, all these gifts is resident with the person. Right? You know, uh, you know, there's this saying, right? Uh, just an example. You know, uh, Sachin Tendulkar, he was he was born to play cricket, right? I don't think he can do anything else. And he himself says that probably, you know, uh, I don't think I can do anything else other than cricket. It was inside him, right? The same way, the ministry gift is inside us. It, it is, it is, it is something that is residing inside us. And as we continue our walk with God, right, as we journey with the Lord, the Lord begins to reveal. His plans. The Lord begins to reveal His purposes, right? So, men and women, all of us, represent Christ's ministry to the church, right? Now, let's look at a few examples. Right? Uh, look at the example of Moses, right? The Bible teaches us that Moses he knew, right? He knew. That God had chosen him to deliver the people out of Egypt. He knew it. It was there inside him. Right. Uh, even though he made a mistake, he delayed the whole process. But he knew. Right. It was a it, it was a knowing inside him. Look at the great apostle Paul. He knew that God had called him for a purpose. Right. And he knew the gifting that he had. He knew that I have a ministry to go out, to reach out, to plant churches. It was an apostolic ministry. It is written all over his life. He knew it. How can we say we knew it? He knew it because remember after he uh, after that long break, uh, uh, he comes back to Jerusalem, and what does he do? Immediately, he finds Barnabas. And he says, Barnabas, let's go out. Let's reach out. Let's start on our first missionary journey. Now, were there challenges? Were there difficulties? Yes. But were there churches planted? Yes. Were there miracles? Yes. Were there healings, deliverances? Yes. Now, did the challenges stop him from continuing his ministry? Definitely not. Why? Because it's a gift inside which God has placed. He goes on on his second missionary journey, which was even more difficult than the first missionary journey. Right, and and uh, again we see great, wonderful works. We see that he plants churches in Corinth and Ephesus and uh, Philippi, and and all these wonderful things that he did. 
Why? Because there was a gift inside him. There was this calling, and he walked in that grace. Right? Look at David, king, being a man who was just looking after, you know, uh, sheep and uh, shepherd boy, and God just tells him, "I'm going to make you a leader." There was a knowing inside him that when he becomes king, he had, you know, the first thing he did after he became king, he he brought the brought the ark of the covenant back to Israel, back to Jerusalem. He formed the worship team. You'll learn more of this in the worship ministry as well. But here's what I'm trying to bring out. The ministry gift inside us is, is, a, is a divine call which each one of us must walk in. Some of us may say, I, I don't know what I am, you know, I, whether I'm a pastor. I don't know if I'm an evangelist. I don't know if I... I'm a worship leader, or I, I don't know if, I, if God has just called me to volunteer in the church. Right? And uh, uh, maybe some of us are in that uh, place, and I was in that place as well. But remember, when, when, when the, the gifting inside us, when we are faithful to God, when we begin to serve Him faithfully, God will open the right doors. You know, for me, it was, I was leading worship. I was sharing the word, and I thought, okay, my primary responsibility is to lead worship. And so um, I was com comfortable doing that. All of a sudden, I, uh, I was also preaching, and then I was teaching the Bible college, and I was doing, so I was like, what am I doing? And I love you know, just going out and evangelizing with people. So I thought to myself, what am I? Am I an evangelist? Am I a pastor? Uh, am I a teacher, a pastor? I, I don't know. But here's what I want to encourage each one of us. Don't worry about that. Don't worry, oh, what am I? Am I this? Am I that? Continue to go with what God has opened for you. And as you go through that journey, God will make you understand and realize what your calling is. What is the gift? Because that gift that is in you will begin to, you know, I want to use this word, explode. Right? It'll just manifest in greater realms. And you'll say, hey, I, I never expected this. I never expected to, you know, my uh, work to be so good or I never expected it to be so fruitful. And you will realize it is God's gifting upon us. Right? Is that all right, everyone with me? Right? Feel free to uh, share your thoughts. Uh, if you have questions, also feel free to stop me ask questions, uh, can make it as interactive as possible. Right, shall we go ahead? Shall we continue? Yes, Pastor, we are getting you. Yeah, that's great. Right, so on the notes, uh, point four, men and women are Christ's gift to the church. So you and I are Christ's gifts to the church. We are a gift. So. You may say, I, I'm not a pastor, I'm not an evangelist, I'm not a, you know, uh, any of these in the fivefold ministry. You are still a gift to the church. Because none of us can say we don't have a gift. And none of us can say, uh, you know, this is what I'm, you know, I cannot do anything in the church. None of us can say that. All of us have a gifting in us. Right? Uh, and so God can use that gift. Now, what is the purpose of the fivefold ministry? Is it so that we have some you know leadership in the church, or is it because we need some order in the church, or is it because the church is not going to function properly without this uh, fivefold ministry, or is it because one is better than the other? What is what is the purpose of the fivefold ministry? Right now, this is clearly. Uh, described in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 16. Maybe one of us can read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. Anyone? Okay. 
John, is it okay if you can read? John or Zelly, anyone? Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 16. Ephesians chapter 4 and 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Pastor, till which verse? Verse 16. Okay. Verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the structure of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, that we should no longer be child, uh, children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the tricky of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Right, thank you. Thank you, Zeli. Now, the Apostle Paul is very clearly describing the reason why the fivefold ministry is there, right? Why, is, why does it function? First one, for the perfecting or the equipping of the saints. Uh, what is the word equipping? I'm sure all of us know this, right? Equipping, it, it is to, to learn, to develop, to build, right? So first reason why the fivefold ministry is prevalent in the church is for the equipping of the saints. So that means if I am a, or any one of us are a pastor or an evangelist or a prophet, any of the fivefold ministry, what should be in our mind? The first thing that should be in our mind is, hey, I need to equip my fellow believers. Equip them in what? In the word, equip them in the spirit, equip them in, in right teaching, right uh, understanding of the word, uh, equip them in flowing with the gifts of the Spirit, and there's so much to learn in ministry, right? That is our primary responsibility. Now, the, the, the sad part that we see now is that in the body of Christ, when some of them say, hey, I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet, or I'm an evangelist, and now that becomes a whole place of, you know, position, becomes a uh, a place where people can you know, really look at each other with competition. Right? Uh, hey, I'm a prophet. Uh, you know, I hear from God and I can you know, tell everything. And then he makes the others feel that we are no good, we are useless. Only God is speaking to this prophet about what about us. And then you got uh, some evangelists, you know, they are doing all these wonderful miracles. They're going, reaching out. People are getting healed. People are getting sick. People who are sick are getting healed. Uh, the, all kinds of wonderful miracles. And then sometimes they will make us feel, uh, or we may feel that, hey, how come nothing's happening when I'm doing anything? Right? And there's this feeling of superiority. And when you look at the body of Christ now, we thank God for what God is doing. God still has his people who are true to the faith. But we, when we look on the other side, we see there's competition, there is strife, there is you know, fame. People want power, people want money, they want luxuries. Now, it's not wrong to want all of this, you know, luxuries and money and all of this is important. But if that becomes priority, we are failing in the first aspect. What is the first aspect? For equipping the same. Now, if I'm a prophet or if I'm a pastor, and in my mind, I'm just thinking, I want to be a pastor of 1,000 people, or my church would become 2,000, 3,000 people. If I'm thinking that, I have failed in the first point. right? Because my, my first responsibility is to equip the saints, whether they are five people, whether they are 5,000 people. My responsibility is to equip the saints, right? That's what Paul is saying, for the equipping or the perfecting of the saints, right? So remember, each one of us, you know, we may be in, you know, rural areas, we may be ministering in urban areas. Nobody may even know about our church. Right? You may be just a starting, started a small group, 
Nobody may even know what you're doing. But if you are as a as a leader, as a pastor or a teacher, whatever God has called you to do, if you are doing the ministry with a mindset that I have to equip the people of God to be more Christ-like, you're on the right track. Right? You are doing what God has asked you to do. You, are, you will see the fruit in your life. Now, remember, uh, you know, uh, somebody asked me this question. Is fruit you know, fruit of the ministry, is it only numbers? Right? You see churches with 10,000, 20,000 people. Uh, is the fruit only through numbers? And my answer is no. It's not only through numbers. And uh, when we look at revivals uh, back uh, in the early centuries, uh, it was not only numbers. We saw the equipping of saints. We saw that people were getting equipped to do ministries. And of course, there were large numbers. You know, I was reading uh, an article from Christianity Today and how you know, nowadays we've got these young pastors, very good in speaking, right? They've got a very good intellectual understanding of what's happening around the world. Very, very, very prolific readers wonderful uh, speakers, very, you know, confident and all of that. And then they go to a certain place and they'll find out why people are not coming to church. Right. And so after finding out, they'll find out, okay, they'll get a survey and then they will plant a church and they will choose, you know, things that these people who are from what the response they've got, they'll choose to do something which is, you know, appropriate for them. And that's why churches are becoming big. Many thousands of them are flocking. Uh, and so we, as Christ's body, must understand that our main responsibility is equipping of the saints. Not that our name is, you know, becomes big, but God's name is glorified. And I see a question from Lyndon. So how would we differentiate the role of an apostle and evangelist? Okay. Uh, Lynn, we will be talking more about that from the next chapter, but just to briefly answer your question. Now, the word pastor means shepherd, right? And a shepherd is somebody who, uh, you know, uh, he will, God has called him to be with that certain, in that certain place. Now, for example, uh, a, a pastor can, uh, you know, if, if he's, if he's looking after the church, that is his, you know, he's going to be shepherding them looking after them right they'll have troubles there'll be difficulties uh, they'll have good times bad times right and that's his main responsibility to shepherd to look after the sheep now an evangelist is very different because what he can do is he can go to a place he will start a church or he'll go to minister to people right he can either start a church or he won't start a church but an evangelist doesn't stay in one place. Right? He's always moving about. Right? Um, and so they, now remember that these both these roles can also be, you know, uh, can come together. But in the ministry function, right, it's it's different. A pastor is somebody who will shepherd a group, a set of people, but an evangelist is somebody who can who just keeps moving, traveling, ministering to people, right? And when it comes to missionary, what, what you've mentioned here, missionary is somebody who is more inclined towards a certain cause, right? So for example, Heidi Baker, when she was praying, she said, uh, I want to go to Mozambique in Africa and, uh, you know, help them there, right? So she went there, she stayed there, she started a work and, that's how a mission field has been, you know, begins there. I mean, uh, so so it's very different, right? Uh, and we'll talk more about this, Lyndon, uh, even as we go, because now we are in chapter one. We're just talking about the introduction, but when we get to each aspect, like evangelist and the teacher and the pastor, we we'll look at the differences as well. I hope, hope that's all right. I hope that answers a bit of your question. Is that okay, Lyndon? Okay. 
All right. Uh, so let's carry on. Uh, yeah. The second purpose of the fivefold ministry, so that the saints can do the work of the ministry. Now, what is the first one? To equip the saints. For what? For what to equip the saints? So that they go directly to heaven? No. Right? It, it's not that they should go to heaven or they should have a good life. All of that is part of it. But the equipping is so that the saints also will do the work of the ministry. So it's a chain reaction. I equip you, you choose somebody else, you equip them, and then the work continues. Right? So it doesn't stop. It's a chain reaction. Right? And third one, this chain reaction will result in the building of the body of Christ. So you see that it all just so beautifully comes together. First, Paul says, listen, the purpose of this fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, uh, evangelist, pastor, teacher, the, 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 the purpose of this first one is to equip the saints, not for anything else, not so that my ministry will be known so that I come on YouTube and Facebook. That's not the reason. First one is to equip the saints. Two, after equipping the saints, the saints, the believers, must be willing to go and do the ministry. They must be equipped enough. And three, because they are doing this, the body of Christ is being built up. Now, don't you think the Apostle Paul has done this so beautifully? Remember what he did? He chose this young man, Timothy. He said, Timothy, you come with me. I'll teach you everything. Right? So wonderful it was. I mean, if you think of it, Apostle Paul was a great man. He had such a great understanding. And he had this great revelation of who Jesus Christ was. And he chooses a 17-year-old boy who doesn't know anything. Right? Uh, he only knew, okay, he was a Jew. But he chooses him. He doesn't say, hey, uh, Timothy, you know what? You join Bible colleges, go to Gamaliel, uh, stay there for three years. I'll come after three years and I'll see if you're ready. I'll take you. No. He says, okay, I have to do what I have to do is I have to equip this boy. So he takes him along in the missionary journey. Two, what does he tell Paul? Paul, uh, sorry, what does he tell Timothy? Timothy, do the work of the ministry. Remember in 2 Timothy, in the final letter, he says, preach the word in season, out of season. Be the work of the ministry. right? And three, Apostle Paul tells Timothy, you look after the church in Ephesus and build the body of Christ there. He does it so beautifully. Now, each one of us are called for that. right? You may say, but I'm working in the, you know, I'm in the workplace. I'm working nine to five. Go home. I have a family. I don't have time for this. True. I understand. But wherever we get an opportunity, we can, you know, be people who can teach others, equip others, minister to each other. Now, remember, when you're doing it one on one, it's not something that, you know, people will, you know, applaud us or say, oh, wonderful work. Nobody may say that. But what is happening is there is a building of the body of Christ. You're equipping the saints for the ministry. Right? Now, how long will this continue? It will continue till, till the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Right? We, till we all come to the unity of the faith, each one of us. Um, and then when we say unity of the faith, it only means that we are united together in Christ. right? And we understand that it's very little to do about us and more about the Lord Jesus. Right? It's very little to do about our gifts because the gift also is given by God. Not only the calling, but also the gift. I come to the unity of the faith by saying, God, I don't care. I don't really, it doesn't really matter whether we are a pastor or a ministry. It's there, but 
we want this so that we can all come to the unity of the faith. Two, so that we can all come to the knowledge of the Son of God. Right? What is the job of an apostle? Start churches, plant churches, equip the saints. And if you look at all of them in the fivefold ministry, it is the same responsibility. Bring people to the knowledge of Christ. And all of us want that. Right? Now, if if uh, example, right? If an unbeliever comes to church and there's a pastor there, will the pastor say, Hey, I'm a pastor, I'm supposed to shepherd this flock. So you I'll meet you, I'll call an evangelist. He's good at sharing the gospel. He will come and speak to you. Will he say that? He's not going to say that, right? Uh, why? Because all of us have the responsibility of sharing, it's the same gospel. We share that gospel and bring people to the knowledge of God. These functions, the functions on how we do it may be different. Right? Thirdly, this will continue till we all come to a perfect, mature man, the full measure of Christ's stature. This whole fivefold ministry will continue and continue and continue till all of us become the mature man. That is to be in Christ likeness. The Apostle Paul says it so beautifully. He says, imitate me just like I imitate Christ. Uh, I, I don't know how many of them can say that, but that's what God expects of us. Um, at, you know, in the body of Christ, that each one of us become mature the full measure of Christ's stature. Now, even as we do all this and we study all this, the enemy knows, right? Okay, these are people uh, you know, who are mentoring other people, who are teaching other people. And that is why the enemy targets leaders, right? He targets leaders. He will, you know, try to crush them. He will try to bring all kinds of difficulties and challenges upon them. You know, he will try to just ruin their ministries. And he has done it in so many uh, instances, and he has been successful. That is why we need to be strong as leaders. Come to the unity of the faith. Understand that we are not building our own kingdom, but the kingdom of God. Right. So this is just uh, half of the introduction. Any questions? Uh, do you have any questions? Any thoughts? You can continue. Should we continue? Okay. Yes, Pastor. Okay. All right. So. Uh, um, yes. Go ahead, uh, Isaac. Do you have a question? I was just saying. I was just saying you are on cause, so. We are following. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Paul. Right. So just a side note here. The pastor and the teacher are considered extensions of the same ministry. Now, uh, there are many, you know, uh, when we look at revisions of the Bible, when we look at these new teachings that have come up, uh, many have considered pastor and teacher as one, right? And so they've reduced the fivefold ministry into four, right? Because a pastor will also teach, right? So this that's uh, common sense, uh, but but we will stick to the fivefold ministry because I personally know of people who can you know who are called to teach. They can only teach, but they can't pastor a church. I personally know of people, so uh, they are extensions of the same function, uh, but not always. You know, a teacher can be a pastor, or a pastor can be a teacher. Not always. Right? Uh, so we will stick to the fivefold ministry. Now let's read First Corinthians chapter 12, 28 to through 31. First Corinthians 12, 28 through 31. Yes, any one of us? First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 through 31. First Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 28 to 51. And God has set some in the church first apostles, secondly prophets, 
Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then, gift of feelings. Faith, government, diversity of tongues. And all apostles are, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles. Are all the gifts of aliens? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gift, and yet show, show high unto you a more excellent way. Thank you, Abu Bakr. Thank you. Uh, now, this passage is a little bit confusing. Why? Because Paul says, God has chosen some, and then he starts off the word by saying first. right? So first, the apostles, then second, the prophet, third, the teachers. So he goes on in the list. Now, why does he say first, second, third? Is it because the prophets, apostles are the highest, uh, highest calling, and then second comes a prophet? Uh, uh, and and is there is there a certain order in in their in in their ranks? Now we know that you know the Bible teaches us that God is a God of order. There's no confusion in His kingdom, right? He's not the author of confusion. He's a God of order. Whatever God has done and is doing, He does it in an orderly manner. It's not like you know, the church was birthed in the book of Acts and people were just doing everything. No. God gave the wisdom to the leaders to make them understand, hey, that there has to be certain order. right? Now, remember, uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians, right? And what does he tell them? Hey, y'all are coming to church and some of them are leading worship, some of them are talking to each other, some of them are having the Lord's table. There's no order in the church. There's confusion. So he gets really upset. He says, hey, don't you have homes to eat and drink and talk? Don't you come to church? Learn to you know, uh, do things in an orderly manner. So it's true that there is spiritual order set in church. Right? Now, this order is not, uh, it's not an order of superiority. Right, it's not like apostles are more superior than prophet and uh, pastors are, you know, the last on the list. No, it's just order that God has designed. Right, so this division will, you know, help us to clearly understand the functions of the ministry. Right now, make sure that you understand this that it's not. That you know, these or this order is not right. So be assured of this. It's not something that uh, you know. This is they are greater than I am. I am smaller. You know, right? Um, in First Corinthians twelve twenty eight, one there are two important points we must understand why this order has been placed. First one for establishment. Right? Uh, when you look at the early church. Thousands of people were added into the church, right? And out of these thousand people, thousands of people, how will how will they choose? Right? Uh, how will they choose to Abu Bakr? I'll just come to your question. Uh, so, out of these thousands of people, how do they choose who's doing what? Right? What if uh, in the thousand people there are hundred prophets, but they are only uh, serving uh, coffee? Or what if there are you know? some you know hundred wonderful teachers but they're only sitting every sunday listening to the sermon right so how do they uh, choose people and that is why this order of establishment was set in place in the early church they said god gave the apostles first okay you have an apostolic calling and they understood it, right and so they were given priority first okay you as a leader, you set certain things in the church, right? Now, for example, if you see uh, Peter and James, they were the apostles uh, in the early church. They were given, you know, James became the leader of the church. Right? But if you look back, he hardly had any experience. He is the 
half brother of jesus who said uh, you know jesus has gone mad is out of his mind but now few years later he's a leader of the church in jerusalem why because they saw that there was the apostolic calling in him right and out of these thousands of people basically what paul is trying to say is when you have order you will know how to work within the church now for example this uh, let's take an example right say there are 500 people in a church current day 500 people in church now in that 500 people there are maybe 10 people who are unwell and if i don't know what i should do or who i should reach out to there could be confusion in in the church right but if i know hey this person has a healing uh, you know he has that healing ministry and when he prays that really that gift is there in him he's like an evangelist who you know has that gift of healing and miracles so i can go to him or her and say hey you know what i'm going through this difficulty i have this sickness it's been there for the past 10 years can you please pray for me i think wrong in going to the pastor but you can also go here i hope you're getting what i'm trying to say right then you probably have you know some teachings in the church and maybe you're confused oh but you know the scriptures uh, you've read something uh, read a passage you're confused it says why does paul say a woman should not preach and you're confused right so you know hey there are teachers within the church right so i can go to them and find out what the what 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 this means right so i can go and say okay this person is a good teacher is well versed with the word of god so let me go and check with him and so don't you feel there's so much order right there's no chaos right now the pastor should not feel bad oh these people are in my church why are they going asking you know uh, people within the church they can come and ask me now if the pastor is feeling bad then he has this insecurity problem right he's insecure uh which should not be there right because the body of christ will have all these functions and there's an order in, in the way things are done right uh let's look at abu bakr's question he says can a teacher of the word start a local church okay that's a very very good question abu bakr now here's what i would say personally is what i understand right now as we said a teacher and a pastor are extensions of the same ministry right now if you feel uh, if there's a if there's a teacher right a person who's very well versed to the word he's an excellent teacher and if he feels if god leads him uh, you know you start a church and your church will be only focusing on teaching of the word of god definitely god can use him to start a church right there's no limitations right uh, but there could be a teacher who say no this is what i want to do i want to like personally i know of people who are very 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 good teachers they are excellent but they only prefer going to small groups and teaching they prefer that they prefer one on one five people 10 people i'll go teach them really equip them let them do the work let them become pastors or leaders right uh so yes you have to answer your question a teacher can start a local church but he or she must be very careful uh to uh, to know that okay god has you know, really directed me and instructed me to do this if there's a leading there's a calling and there's a push from god then yes definitely they can but if there's no push from god uh, just continue to teach right whether it's a small group setting bigger setting just go ahead and teach so uh Abu Bakr, I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir, Pastor. You have answered yes. the question. Right. Great. All right. So uh, we'll take a ten-minute break. We'll come back at ten uh, o'clock. We'll continue with our second session. Ten minutes break. Thank you. <laughs> 